Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Trusted CI webinar for December 9th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is DDoS Defense in Depth for DNS. DDIDD, uh, project overview and early results with John Heidemann. John is principal scientist at the University of Southern California, uh, the uh, University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute, and a research professor at USC in computer science. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, uh, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. As some of you already demonstrated, click on the icon and type your question. And we will accept questions at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, with that, I will hand things over to John. John, welcome. Okay, and you should see me sharing. Yep, I can see you pulling a PowerPoint. Yep. Yes. The inevitable talk beginning. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're good? Yes. Okay, hi. So, uh, hi folks. Uh, this, I'm John Heidemann. This is joint work with my co-PIs, Wes Hardiker and Yelena Merkovic, uh, both also at uh, USC Information Sciences Institute. Uh, sorry, looking, there we are. Um, so, uh, we all know DDoS is bad. Uh, so this is a slide uh, on the top left is from Arbor in 2012 when the problem was getting, we knew how bad it was because it was up to tens of gigabytes uh, per second, gigabits per second. Uh, it's getting worse, uh, hundreds of gigabits per second uh, in the 2013 or so, and even worse. Um, we all know uh, attacks that made the, the New York Times uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, and attacks over a terabit a second were were like fantasy in DARPA program land uh, in 2015, but were reality in 2018. Okay, so the attacks just keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, and they're not just bigger, but they're also a lot more numerous. Um, Booter or DDoS as a service is a thing. And for as little as a dollar attack, any fool can go rent uh, a botnet or a part of a botnet and, a, and attack their gaming buddies and kick them off of Fortnite or whatever the target of the day is. Okay, and, and this is a problem because we want to run services that are robust to DDoS, yet if a script, you know, if any teenager can go rent uh, a, a 10 gigabit a second attack, that's a real problem. Um, and of course, the research community knows all about this and has been working on it for years and years. And you can think about two classes of solutions. One is fixing the core problem, right? It shouldn't be possible to spoof, spoof traffic. It should be possible to keep our devices secure. Yet fundamentally addressing the root cause has a misalignment of the costs and benefits, meaning the people who have to pay the cost of say building secure IoT devices are not the people who get any benefit from it because uh, if your IoT device is $15 and your competitors is 12, everybody will buy the competitors regardless of how secure it is. So, uh, and, and the same thing applies to source address filtering, right? Which, which protects the internet from your people being bad, but doesn't really change the, move the needle for yourself. So the other alternative on the right is mitigating the problem after it happens. And I'm sure many of us subscribe to traffic scrubbing services, which are available commercially today. Uh, others of us choose to outsource our infrastructure to Akamai or Cloudflare or other very large providers. Um, and these work, but they have a challenge, which is they can be expensive, right? As an individual, I can't contract out to Akamai. And as a project, as a research project, I don't really want to outsource and spend my NSF dollars on Akamai. Um, and they cost an autonomy. So if you have special purpose uh, infrastructure, which you have to run, it's not just a static web page, um, that becomes a lot more difficult to outsource. And um, if you have something sensitive, which you don't want to outsource, like say uh, student grades, 
that becomes quite challenging to outsource. Okay, so current approaches of either fixing the problem or mitigating the problem are not satisfactory in all cases, although both are widely uh, deployed. Uh, so the fundamental problem here is that if you're running an open service like a website or a DNS service or a shibboleth authentication, um, you must accept queries from everywhere. That's the purpose of your being on the internet. Uh, yet fundamentally, there's millions and millions of devices that will never be secure and can be used to mount an attack on you. So there's a real challenge that DDoS attackers have an advantage and there's no easy way to defend. So that's the environment that our project uh, was, is premised against. So our approach is uh, defense in depth. Uh, we believe that there's no single silver bullet. It's not like we're going to invent the perfect filter that works in all cases. Instead, we propose this concept we call deep layers, which is to have a collection of countermeasures uh, of different approaches uh, and to open source them so that anybody who wants to run their own infrastructure can deploy these countermeasures um, and protect against uh, different kinds of attacks. And if you're running your own, your own infrastructure, you know, you may never be able to protect against the terabit attack, but we'd like to think that you can protect against the 10 gigabit attack um, in-house. Um, and we'd like to think that my project can protect against, you know, one gigabit attack without too much trouble. Um, and so our goal is to document how to do this and to make software available uh, open source so that you can do this uh, if you choose to as an alternative to just outsourcing everything. Um, and I should say, um, uh, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. And I think uh, Jeanette has agreed to, if you type your questions to uh, make sure I notice them. So uh, please uh, interrupt at any time uh, through the chat window. Um, so the idea is defense in depth. Um, this is an NSF project supported by the CC program. Uh, it's been running for about a year and a half. Um, it builds on a bunch of other DHS and NSF projects, uh, some of which are completed and some of which are ongoing. And I'll say more about that later. Um, and in my work, you'll notice we have a target application in mind, which is DNS. Um, and you'll see why, because we're leveraging uh, BROOT, which is a high profile service that USC runs um, that gets reasonably frequent DDoS attacks. Um, and, and in particular, we're focused on that because DDoS is a particularly challenging service because uh, for two reasons, one is uh, UDP uh, has no connection to handshakes, so it's easy to spoof. It's very difficult to detect and prevent spoofers. Um, and the other challenge with BROOT is um, the service level agreement that the root servers have uh, is that we're going to reply to all traffic. Um, and so while we have an exception and are allowed to block traffic during uh, DDoS events, um, we do hard to service all queries the rest of the time. So although you'll see my, um, my the, the examples that I use are primarily DNS-based, um, several of our techniques generalizing and are applicable uh, outside of, of uh, uh, to other kinds of services like HTTP or web-based services. Um, and in particular, one reason we're interested in BROOT is um, we do, USC operates BROOT and we work closely with the BROOT team. And so we have an option to take the approaches that we prototype and uh, transition them into operational use in BROOT and prove that they work in operational setting and not just in the lab. Um, we're not just working with BROOT on this. We also are working with other root operators and we have a long history of collaborating with uh, SIDN labs and University of 20 in the Netherlands who operate the Netherlands uh, country code. Um, so uh, we are very serious about testing our approaches in the real world through these means. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about where we are. So this is a project in progress, so it's not all in the past. <laughs> Some of the work is ongoing. Um, uh, so, but I wanna tell you what the progress we've made to date. 
And in particular, I want to start by talking about the kind of filters that we've been thinking about and the system that we're putting those into place. So let me talk about five of those really briefly. So the first filter is we call source address filtering. So this is not a new idea. It's the idea that you identify your uh, regular customers and you make sure that if you're under attack, you serve your regular customers. Um, the, we call that the whitelist um, and drop traffic from uh, people not who haven't been your prior customers because those are probably attackers, probably compromised devices. Um, and so this approach is fairly straightforward. It's widely used in industry, although uh, we don't know of uh, people who have uh, released open source uh, tools for it. Um, the downside is it's easy to end up with a whitelist that's not perfect. So we've done some studying about how you should build your whitelist. Um, and ultimately, as a defense, it's not perfect because a volumetric attack can overwhelm your incoming circuits. But for moderate size attacks, uh, this works well at reducing outgoing uh, bandwidth. And so the work we've done here um, is to test IP sets, which is a plugin for Linux uh, IP tables that allows uh, source address uh, filtering to scale up to millions of uh, incoming addresses. And we've been happy with this tool. Um, it's able to handle the, si the customer size that vRoot typically sees. Um, and the other work we've done is to automate whitelist uh, construction for vRoot and to test how well that works. And I think, uh, I don't have slides here, but we have, we've studied uh, the duration that vRoot needs to build its whitelist. You can build a whitelist on an hour's worth of traffic um, and get something like 80% of your customers. Um, so uh, that work uh, is uh, fairly mature and deployed in vRoot today. Um, the second kind of filter, the second, third types of filter I want to talk about are hop count filtering and client modeling. So hop count filtering takes source address whitelisting one step further, which is rather than look just at the source IP and allow people in you've seen before, we want to remember how many IP hops away they were. And this is per, the IP hop count is in the uh, time to live field of the IP header. And this is another level of check uh, because as long as routes are stable, the IP hop count uh, uh, will be unique or relatively unique uh, to the typical location of that uh, IP address in the internet relative to us. And it's difficult for attackers to guess that. The second aspect that we're looking on in this combined solution is client modeling. And so we look at the, the, uh, the traffic rate of each individual source IP address. And if you're sending much faster traffic than typical, we think you may have been uh, taken over by a bad guy and, and, and maybe deserve filtering. So these two concepts, hop count filtering to get rid of spoofing for the most part, and client modeling to get rid of those that hop count filtering doesn't get, are the next uh, approach that we're looking at. So we've looked at both of these carefully and a hop count filtering is not a new idea but has never been uh, carefully studied. Um, and I have some data on the next slide I'll report about precision. Um, software wise, um, we extended IP sets uh, to also do hop count filtering with an additional field. Um, and we're currently evaluating that. Uh, so that's new software that we've developed building on IP sets. Um, and we're gonna open source that by uh, the beginning of the new year. Um, and just to show you for hop count filtering. So the graph on the left shows you the uh, collateral damage, meaning how much good traffic is lost if we uh, do hop count filtering on different amounts of training time. And what you can see on the graph on the left be careful, this is a log scale. So, um, so uh, uh, small differences in the y-axis make a big difference in the, the, the error rate. But the bottom line is if you train for an hour, you get most of the correct answers. And as a result, filtering accuracy is very high as you can see on the graph on the right. And again, this, if you look at the y-axis, uh, one is, the, is perfection and you can see we're very close to one. Um, both with a naive attacker, somebody's randomly generating traffic, which is typical today, but even if the attacker is smart and is trying to guess the uh, typical hop count, um, we still get very high accuracy. 
Um, and in fact, we explicitly looked at, at naive, uh, smart, and perfect attackers. Um, a naive attacker, uh, we filter 98% uh, of their traffic, so it's very good against them. An attacker that's smart enough to study and guess the most popular TTL to the target, to us, um, uh, gets a certain amount of traffic to, through, uh, but we still filter uh, about half of them. And of course, an omniscient attacker who guesses, who knows exactly the distance of everybody to us can get 100% of the traffic through. But of course, that's impossible. That's an Oracle kind of attack. Um, so we, we're very happy with hop count filtering as, a, as an approach that we think people should be deployed, deploying in practice. Um, but to deal with the, either the smart attackers or the worst case omniscient attacker, we're also looking at client modeling. So the idea here is that we uh, examine the attack rate, I'm sorry, we examine the typical query rate of each source IP. Um, and if uh, somebody is sending way more traffic than is typical, we believe, we hypothesize that they are, uh, have been subverted and are now an attacker. And so we would start filtering them. And we look at both the query rate and also in particular the error rate because oftentimes attackers use uh, random domain names to try to get through caches. And we've evaluated this on a number of actual data sets from, from 2017 vRoot. Um, and here is the performance for two of those. So the left graph shows collateral damage, meaning legitimate traffic and how much we pass through. Uh, we pass almost all of it through, which is uh, what we wanna do. And the right is the attack traffic shown in red against uh, how much, well, the gray is how much it's sent and the red is how much uh, we've uh, passed through our filter and we're able to filter most of the attack traffic. So we're very happy with the client modeling work as well. Um, it's a bit more intensive uh, than hop count filtering, uh, but it's a good second line of defense. And that fits within our model of defense in depth with multiple approaches. So, one thing we've been doing is to study these using attacks from BRoot. And so the dates on the left are, are different days that there were anomalous events in BRoot traffic. We've curated this traffic and used it to test our work. And we're making those data sets available in an anonymized form uh, uh, to other researchers as well as one of the outcomes of this project. But for client modeling in particular, uh, we're very happy with the precision and recall um, for these events listed here. Uh, moving on, the fourth kind of filter we talk about is R code blacklisting or response code blacklisting. And this builds on the idea that attackers often send random strings that are all going to fail. Now, the challenge is that normal people send random strings too. Like every time you make a typo and type google.com with two M's, um, that goes to a root server and gets uh, negative replied. Um, but, so, so we don't want to, so the proposal with response code blacklisting is that we want to deny, we want to not respond to negative replies. So there's a large amount of collateral damage here. Um, but if you're getting attacked and generating, you know, 10 or 100 times the number of negative replies that you usually do, uh, better to have some collateral damage uh, and allow people who make legitimate queries for .com to get through uh, than to just fail completely. So that's the idea behind this filter. Um, and then the final comment is, so we've seen four filters to date, right? Uh, uh, source IP whitelisting, hop code, uh, client modeling, and R code uh, blacklisting. So given all these filters, the obvious question is, how do you choose what to deploy if you get attacked? And our argument, the premise behind the project is you can't just pick one because different attacks stress different uh, defenses. So we've done a fair amount of work in automating defenses and have a, a tool in place that uh, automates attack detection based on resource exhaustion and then automates defense selection based on uh, knowledge about the defenses and examination of the preliminary traffic in the attack. And we think automated defenses is, is essential for people who are hosting their own services. And in fact, we know that commercial services automate defenses as well, of course. Um, 
the point of our work is to provide an open source tool that allows you to automatically select between a variety of defenses and not just engage one or, or to it. So to show the need for automating defenses, uh, here you can see again a number of, uh, of anomalous events curated from Beirut. And you can see us applying three different defenses in the left part of this table. So these are different real world attacks. Um, you can see that different defenses are required for different kinds of attacks. So query blacklisting always works. Um, source uh, whitelisting works okay in some cases. Oops. Uh, in fact, these first two cases, the, the green box should be over here on the left. Um, source whitelisting works well there. Um, so you can see the important point is different defenses uh, work better for different kinds of attacks. Um, and our automated tool analyzes the traffic during an attack, detects the attack and analyzes the traffic and deploys a filter. And you can see in about 10 seconds, it typically deploys the best filter. And so we're happy with that. Now, in some cases, like in this case here, we actually had to try several filters before uh, finding the best filter. In fact, we had to rotate through all three filters that we were testing at this time. And so uh, that's a case where automated defense really pays off because we're able to try multiple filters, uh, starting with one that has the least collateral damage and then working our way up to ones that are less desirable but still provide some protection. Um, and so that's the, our, the argument we're advancing for um, the role of automated, automation uh, in this process in DDoS defense. And to get an idea of what that looks like in practice, uh, this is trace replay. And we're looking at three metrics in this graph. Each, row, each column is a different metric. So we look at ingress bandwidth, uh, CPU usage, and outgress or egress traffic. And as you can see, the biggest stress in this DDoS attack is outgoing uh, traffic. So we've, we're replaying this in test bed with one gigabit, uh, a one gigabit network. And the graphs don't have the same scale, but you can see ingress is, uh, ingress is small, but egress traffic is very large. And I think that graph is mislabeled and should not be CPU, but bit rate. Um, but uh, ingress bitrate is, is way less than a, a megabit, I believe. It's around a megabit here. But egress traffic is pushing a gigabit, which is what we were uh, capping traffic at this, uh, in this trace replay experiment. OK, so the, the stress is on the egress network traffic. Um, automating defenses work. And you can see if you compare in the top row without running any defense, to the middle row running our, our basic single filter, you can see we drop traffic uh, uh, to normal with the filter. So this service would be 100% effective in this case. However, what you can also see is this attack is polymorphic, meaning uh, 90 seconds into the attack, it changes from sending one type of attack to sending a different type of attack. And so our initial filter fails. And our automated system detects this because it notices that it, egress traffic goes way up again. And so uh, the automated system reassesses uh, the performance of filtering and deploys a different filter uh, midway through this attack. And so this shows the importance of automation to deal with polymorphic attacks um, and also to deal with challenging attacks in general. Now, uh, the thing you'll notice about this attack that we were replaying, um, we're able to get down egress traffic. And in this case, this would defend against this attack. But of course, you can imagine cases where it's not the egress traffic, right? Traffic leaving our system. And by the way, with DNS, traffic leaving the system is about uh, 10 to 17 times bigger than ingress traffic because the replies are much bigger than the queries. But in other kinds of attacks, the ingress traffic is actually the problem, right? If they just flood your incoming links so completely, it doesn't matter what you do filtering the traffic. And so the final kind of defense we're looking at is uh, being able to on-demand shift some traffic to the cloud. Um, we don't want to run in the cloud 24-7 because clouds are expensive um, and you pay per uh, capacity um, and you lose autonomy. But uh, 
if the choice is do nothing or fail um, and fail or uh, run part of your service in the cloud, it's clearly important to, to run in the cloud under failure. And so we've been working with a number of different cloud providers about how to do this. And I'm gonna talk about on the next slide what we're doing currently. So in particular, we're working with BeRoot and Amazon Web Services. Amazon has a service called BYO IP, bring your own IP, which lets them service your IP addresses from the cloud. Um, and so BeRoot would continue to operate its own servers, uh, but would it, also, it would also operate service from Amazon for at least some of its clients. Um, and of course, once you get into Amazon, you can scale out by purchasing more capacity uh, as you need it. And so we have a prototype in place and we're working on integration and expect by middle of next year to be able to demonstrate this in practice, uh, this kind of hybrid uh, self-run slash cloud service um, with the idea that during an attack that it affects ingress bandwidth, you would scale up your cloud capacity and let the cloud uh, uh, sync all that traffic. So the final thing I wanted to mention before uh, wrapping up is uh, part of the side effects of this project is we curated a bunch of anomalous events from BeRoot. Um, and so we have five events, and I think that's actually dated. I think we're up to eight or 10 so far uh, that we're making available uh, publicly anonymized uh, traffic. We also have uh, diddle data from BeRoot um, which is two days of traffic that gives you not just uh, attack events, but also uh, regular traffic in case you need to train, uh, particularly for machine learning type of defenses. And we also provide a full week of data um, that allows an even longer training period and lets you see diurnal and weekly effects in the data. And so we're making this data available uh, and encourage other researchers who have perhaps new filters to test to take a look at it. So I wanted to say, obviously there's other uh, research projects going on and I wanted to briefly mention three other projects uh, involving USC. So uh, Yelena Merkovic has a project called LEADER which is looking specifically at low rate attacks that, that just got underway recently. Um, I lead a project called PADOS which is joint with the Netherlands um, that's looking at any cast uh, and in particular use of cloud uh, for DDoS defense. Uh, so that's ongoing. And we're just uh, this fall getting Diner working. Diner is a longer term project trying to support the use of BeRoot uh, with external researchers in NSF. So, um, and in particular, not just data availability, but also to allow experimentation on live, uh, live traffic and to allow uh, tests of other people's experiments uh, in the context of a real root server. So all of these uh, emphasize different aspects of DDoS defense. Uh, all are somewhat related to this project. Um, and if any sound interesting, please uh, ask me or send me mail or send the PI's mail. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, DDoS is a really hard problem yet an important problem one we're all dealing with. Um, we've started to deploy the tools developed, developed uh, under development through, the, uh, uh, through this project in uh, through the DDID project uh, in BeRoot to test them and we're making them open sourced as they be, as they mature um, and there's additional tools and data sets available today I, um, so thank you for your attention and let me know if you have any questions great um, I'm I just wanted to say thank you for making your data available because oh. that's always such a challenge uh, providing good examples for people to kind of research. Um, while people are typing, I want to go ahead and uh, go over a couple of things, uh, little bits of news uh, related to trusted CI and some other issues. So uh, first, um, why don't I pop up our survey here. So uh, I, I just put a survey in the chat. Um, for those of you who would like to give us your feedback, uh, let us know what you thought of the presentation, but also uh, we leave a comment field uh, for you to let us know if uh, there's other topics you would like to us to present, or if, if you would like to present, let us know, and we'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Um, 
As I said earlier in uh, the presentation, Trusted CI has an open window for our, our applications to the fellows program. And the applications are actually, I think, pardon, I think we pushed the date back to the, to the uh, 21st because of the holiday. So uh, it's actually late, a little bit later than January 17th. But if you are interested in the fellows program and want to learn more, please come to our webinar on December 17th. Uh, there's a registration link for that on the homepage or you can learn more about the program by going to trustedci.org slash fellows slash apply. Uh, a little bit about the Trusted CI webinar series uh, to view presentations, join the announcements mailing list, submit requests to present, uh, visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is going to be January 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Our topic is going is to be determined because we are in the process of accepting a uh, request to present. So if you are interested in presenting a webinar, please go to our website and we have an application form there available to you. And with that, I'm gonna take a last request for questions. Um, Okay. And uh, John, I wanted to thank you uh, okay. for presenting on your uh, on your research. Thank you very much. Um, I will share the slides, and um, I encourage anybody to email me questions uh, or uh, if you're interested in the tools or data sets, um, I'm happy to answer questions directly. And you can check out our website. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, I think with that, we will wrap up the presentation. So I wanted to thank all of you for attending. And I will be posting this as well as the slides uh, hopefully later today. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you.